the book of Acts again. I just want to rip off this morning verse 42, if that's all right with you. And scripture says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. And you may be seated in the house right now. <laughs> I was, I was reading through this biblical text and I was listening for the voice of God, waiting for the Holy Spirit to reveal to me well, His truth and what it was He wanted me to convey to you this morning. And so He said, Smith, on Sunday morning, when you stand before the people and ask them a question, who needs the church? Who needs the church? History has it that it's between 60 and 62 AD. Now, that's, that's what we used to say it was AD. Now we just say uh, CE, which just means the common era. Now, I'm not sure what they were attempting uh, to delete Christ from uh, the time span or if they had become so intellectually astute that they were able to pigeonhole time better by changing the terminology. So for those of you who are academics today, the common era, we do believe that this book must have been written prior to 70 AD or CE. Early on we thought that it was written later, but because of the research done in the book, and there's no mention of where Rome had burned and, and anything about Nero and his experience and his role in the persecution and the suffering of Christians, it is obvious it must be between 60 and 62. Is that okay? If we can pigeonhole the dates and understand uh, the time period, it helps us to understand just a little bit better about what was transpiring in the text. We are roughly 30 years removed from the time when Jesus was crucified or when he gave up his life on our behalf. History has it that there is a fellow by the name of Luke who actually was the personal attendant or physician for Peter. Middle part of the first century and all of a sudden Dr. Luke is tending to Peter and to other apostles who have followed closely Christ. Uh, they watched his suffering, they watched his persecution, uh, and not only did they see it, but there is written record that some things transpired that they wanted recorded. Dr. Luke has recorded in his letter to Theophilus some things that he had noticed, for he uses pronouns that would suggest that he had a personal existential experience in some of the suffering that the apostles had to endure early on. I'm trying to build a platform so that somehow we can understand what Luke was wanting to convey to Theophilus. Christians are already being persecuted. They are having to deal with stuff like no others have had to deal with. Uh, they were rejected early on by the Hebrews, the Jews, and now all of a sudden the Jews have begun to embrace them because the Jewish nation has decided that some of them would become Christians, so they're having to take off their Hebrew garbs in order to follow Christianity. Their belief is that before you're going to become a Christian, you need to take on ownership of being a Jew, and therefore you must go through some of those initiating rites to make sure that you were going to follow the mandates of the Hebrew and the people of the way. 
The text wants you to know without a doubt that even in the midst of their attempting to follow Christ, they had to go through something. Amen. Amen. The text wants you to know that in order to follow Christ, you are going to have to be able to endure some of the persecution that Christ and his apostles were under. You are not going to just say you're Christian and be Christian in the first century and not have to experience some of the same stuff that some of the others had to go through. Apostles who were following Jesus, who had committed their lives to him, said that they wanted to follow him so badly and be like him that they did not mind becoming martyrs as a result of having taken on the whole ideology of being Christians. So some of them were cast into the amphitheaters. They were laid out before all these animals, clothed in animal skins, draped in blood, so that somehow, if you were going to follow Christ, you were going to have to deal with some of the same stuff he had to deal with. Some of them were being hung on the cross, crucified. Even Peter himself suggested that I dare not be crucified like my Lord. So if you're going to put me on a cross, hang me upside down. The history has it that those in the first century who wanted to follow Christ had to do with some of the same stuff they had to deal with. And so I move swiftly towards the second chapter. Because the second chapter, the latter part of it, wants you to understand that the church is evolving. It's becoming an entity that God wanted her to be. But before she could become that, she had to be empowered with something. At the beginning of the second chapter of the book of Acts has to do with the presence, that, that thing called the Pentecost, the 50 days after, that would suggest that God would send his Holy Spirit to empower people who before this point and period were pointless, were powerless. And so we find ourselves embarking upon individuals who at one time in their lives were weak. Maybe they were like we are. Maybe, for one reason or another, they had begun to follow the movement. But execution and suffering has a way of causing us to step back. Perhaps the reason why the church in the 21st century is lingering today is because some of us, even though it has not been told, are experiencing suffering and persecution. Maybe you've not gone to the cross. Maybe you've not been boiled in oil. Maybe no one has physically harmed you. But there are some things in your lives that has caused you to back up. Amen. Amen. And so I ask the question again. Who needs the church? Before I can answer the question for you today, who needs the church, we need to define what is the church. What is the church? Is it a building that has been erected where people gather and worship on any given holy day? What is the church? Is it the great numbers that we lie about in our membership? What is the church? Is it the place where people show up for every other Sunday, once a month, every Sunday? Or is it the place where individuals show up and gather as a fellowship and say that we love the Lord and steal at the same time from What is the church? Is the church where we show up on Sunday morning at the holiest hour in human history at 11 o'clock and pretend that we love the Lord, dance and shout and live hellish lives? What is the church? Is it the Greek ecclesia? Is it the place where people gather, who come together, who are called out? From the world and into a place where we can worship God. What is the church? I dare to suggest to you this morning that the church is not the building that has been erected some 10 years ago here in this spot. Or the other one behind us where we worship before we arrived here. 
But I submit to you that the church is that place in your hearts where God resides. It is the place where God shows up and blesses us. Who needs the church? Because we're living in a time when individuals no longer feel that there's any need for a church. Amen. Amen. We can stay at home. We can watch the TV evangelists. We can every now and then send a little something, something to <laughs> some ministry abroad and appease our conscience and make us feel good. Who needs the church? The text says that these individuals have gathered on this day and they've come together and they have broken bread together. They have established koinonia. They've established fellowship and these people have something in common. The commonality that it appears that they have as they gather and greet each other is that they've learned that it is a necessity for them to know what the apostles are teaching. What are the apostles teaching? You know, they met sometime early on in the first century and they called it the Nicene Creed. And they were establishing certain organizational structures so that the church would have some guidelines so it would be able to function properly. And so those individuals who were part of the church at that particular time said, there still appears to be something. It's, we, we recognize that we can come together, we can follow the teaching of the apostles. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, but there still seems to be something missing. Let me park here for a moment. Because even though we meet here on any given Sunday, yeah. there still seems to be something it's missing. We listen to the teaching. We, we set up under the tutelage of individuals from various classes and tribes and listen to the pastor. And we hear all these great things biblically uh, that's going on. But there still seems to be something that's missing. We lay claims uh, that to the fact that when we were saved and became a part of the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit came upon us and we became different Creatures, but there still seems to be something that's missing. And, and the text wants us to know that in the midst of our worship, part and parcel of our challenge is that we've not learned to get along with each other. If you don't mind, let me slip for just a moment from the first century to the 21st century. It appears that today we can become troubled by stuff that really doesn't amount to anything. We can be jealous of somebody else because somebody else has the capability of doing something a little bit better than we can or so we think. Somebody else has touted somebody else and, and given them just a little bit of praise on a particular day and we become troubled because they forgot my name. And so we can all of a sudden become jealous of this segment of the church or that segment of the church because for one reason or another, that person over there seems to get more notice out of the church and the pastor or somebody else than somebody else in the church. And so we become troubled. He's playing favoritism. But she didn't say that I helped her. I know none of you in here are get that way. None of you are troubled. And this happens outside of Second Baptist Church. But something tells me, even in the text, there were folk in the text who were troubled because somebody else was giving some honors to somebody other than them. And so in, in the church, the first century and 21st century, there are people who are just upset because they appear to be giving honors to somebody other than me. Mm -hmm. Who needs the 
church? Who needs to show up on Sunday to be bawled out and to be troubled because the preacher stands up and he talks about we need to learn how to love each other, respect each other, to grow in our relationship? Who needs the church? I told you that they had already discovered uh, that they needed to listen to the teaching of the apostles who were there with Christ when he was here on earth. I told you that the power and presence of the Holy Spirit was there with them. And I told you that something was still missing. They were busy breaking bread together. Yes, they had brought in their possessions and everybody got whatever it was they needed. But there was still something that was missing. And even though I wrestled with this text at length throughout the week, I discovered the one thing that was missing that they had been gathering for. They had forgotten that the central figure in their theology was Christ. And sometimes we can show up in service and we can rub each other on the back and, and give praise to individuals and we can learn more and more about what the Bible said and the history behind the text but the reality of it is is that sometimes, somewhere along the way, we've forgotten that it's all about Jesus it's not about the apostles, they were pushing trying to get individuals to understand that it was all about Jesus it's not about the third part of the triune Godhead. It's all about Jesus. It's the Father, it's the Son, and it's the Holy Spirit. And all three of the triune Godhead work together so that somehow we can understand that it's always been about God. So we can show up in the context of worship and we can appease each other and we can pretend that we worship. But until we learn how to love each other, yeah. until we can get along with each other, there is not sure anything that would show God's presence in our lives. Amen. So yeah, they, they broke bread. Amen. They memorized scripture. Yeah. Isn't that what we do? Amen. Amen. We, we memorize scripture. We, we, we know what Psalms 1 says. We know what Psalms 23 and Psalms 24. We, we got it all down. Yeah. Um, we know some favorite hymns. We can, we can sing those. We can recite those. Um, we know what certain passages of scripture to pull on and say on so that certain parts of the congregation get excited. But have we introduced them to Jesus? When we tickled your ear, when we made you feel good, when you felt like you were somebody because you did a little bit of something, did I remind you of who Jesus was? That he came, suffered, bled, and died, and above all was resurrected from the dead on our behalf. Did I remind you of who he was? Yes, amen. So who needs the church? And I stop by and suggest to you, you need the church. Because when you are sick, you need the church. I know you've got a job that you can run to, but when there is something lurking way down inside of you and work can't help you, you need the church. When the doctor has given up and doesn't have anything promising to say to you, you need church when family becomes fickle and turns its back on you, you need the church. Amen. When the community is not there for you, you need yeah. And this morning, I wanted you to know that when the church is doing what the church is supposed to be doing, the 47th verse in the latter part of it suggested that the Lord added to the church That's right. yeah. Amen. day by day but only when they were guilty of sinning under teaching only when the 
power of the Holy Spirit was upon them. Only when they were breaking bread together in fellowship and only when they got back to Jesus. Amen. We need to stop playing church. Amen. 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 It's not good enough to show up in the house and go through what you've been going through with a funky attitude. Amen. Amen. Pretending that you're close to the Lord when all signs would suggest something other. 